May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Would you please be seated? Please be seated because I am so excited to talk to you about this story tonight. Did you hear what just happened? And did you hear the story that just happened? Saul, persecutor of Christians, is preaching the gospel. Like this story would have been huge in its day. Absolutely huge and shocking. If you are new to um, our, our Book of Acts series, if you're new to the Bible even, I want to give you a little bit of context of just how amazing and incredible this story is. Saul has literally gone into this city to round up Christians and persecute them. And this amazing thing happens, and within just a few days, he's preaching the gospel. And what happens after this moment starts a ministry that is nothing short of epic. In a few years, Saul's going to change his name to Paul, and that's how many of us know him. And Paul's ministry is amazing. He starts preaching the gospel, and he goes out to other countries. He plants churches. Thousands of people come to faith because of Paul's preaching. And as he plants these churches, he starts writing letters to them. And eventually these letters are collected. And uh, in our New Testament, we call them the epistles. And it is from these letters today that we still get so much of our understanding of what it is to live a life of faith, what it is to experience grace, what salvation is all about. And Paul is writing all of this. Even today, he's affecting us. Throughout the last um, 2,000 years, he has been a, a larger-than-life figure. He has been inspirational and controversial and influential. And he has been the subject of artwork and music and books and university courses. And even just this spring, there was a major motion picture that came out called Paul, the Apostle of Christ. And all of that influence started in this one amazing story that we heard tonight. So I want us to take a moment and just look at what is happening. And quite frankly, to marvel at it. Because what we heard tonight is nothing short of supernatural. Now sometimes we get a little uncomfortable using the word supernatural in church. In our society today, we mostly use that word to describe superheroes or fantasy movies. But God is doing something supernatural in this moment. And if we're honest, sometimes hearing about those things makes us a little uncomfortable. So uncomfortable that we try to find another explanation for what's happening. So some people say that um, Saul was actually uh, struggling with his faith. He'd been wrestling with it, and it was in this moment that everything kind of came together, and this is how it gets explained. But if you look at Paul's writings later, he talks about how um, committed he was to being a Jew. And even in this reading, we hear that he is the one who has asked to go into Damascus and round up Christians. So it's hard to see if there's a bit of a struggle there. Some people have said that um, Saul had been hearing the gospel, and the people have been sharing it with him, and that um, suddenly in this moment it all came together, and he converted to Christianity. But later, Paul is going to write that actually no one shared the gospel with him. You didn't receive it from a person. He received it by divine revelation through Jesus Christ. And then, of course, um, people try to explain it scientifically. They try to find a medical explanation that he experienced sunstroke, or perhaps a seizure, perhaps it was some form of epilepsy. Um, there's actually a theory that there was a, a big fireball that went through the sky, and that uh, the knocking down of blindness came from that. The pro but the problem with all of those theories is that none of them quite line up. There's always a symptom or two that are missing, uh, perhaps the thing caused blindness, but blindness is never cured suddenly. And then you have that very sticky point that it wasn't just Paul, Saul, that heard the voices. It was also his companions. And remember, they were not Christians. They had no reason to say that they had heard the voice of Jesus that day. 
So what do we do with this supernatural story? I love looking at the miracles of the Bible. I'm fascinated by the fact that in the Old Testament, the miracles always seem huge and larger than life. They have to do with um, the elements of nature. We have the parting of the Red Sea. We have a burning bush that will not be consumed. We have a pillar of fire. And yet when Jesus does a miracle, it's intimate. It's close. He uses ordinary things. His very first miracle was a jug of water. He heals people using the hem of his garment or a bit of mud on their eyes or just his words. And we see that happening in tonight's story. We see a miracle happening through Jesus' voice, through something that Saul can hear. His eyes are affected, his ability to stand. Someone is brought to heal him. It's close and intimate, like Jesus. And I think there's something else about miracles that kind of kind of rub us the wrong way sometimes. Um, God created this amazing, perfectly ordered, gorgeously complex universe. Like it's truly amazing. The more that humans study it, the more that scientists delve into it, the more there is to discover. It is seemingly never ending. And somehow when we hear about miracles, we kind of get offended that um, God has come in and he's changed the rules. That there's an order to the universe, there's a way that things work. And we see these miracles and we go, well, they can't be true because that's not how it works. But all those things that our scientists are discovering and studying and delving into, God already knows those. He created it all. All that vastness and complexity, He knows the things that we have yet to discover. So maybe when a miracle happens, it's not that God is changing the rules. He just knows them better than we do. Things that seem supernatural to us are natural to God. And I can't help but think about that when I think of this choice of Saul. Saul was on nobody's list of people who are going to be converted to Christianity. He was horrible. He was a terror. As we heard in our story tonight, when Ananias hears that he has to go to Saul, he goes, uh-uh, I know who that is. To be a Christian in that day was to make um, a life-threatening choice. They lived in hiding. They lived in fear. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to really understand the context of that. In our very safe North American world, we, we sometimes misuse the word persecution. We, we use it um, when we're not allowed to say Merry Christmas. Or we can't put a nativity on our desk at work. Those things are definitely annoying. But they're not persecution. Like you, I've turned on the news several times over the last few years, and I've seen stories of people here in North America who are killed in their churches, and their mosques, and most recently in their synagogue. And those stories are horrific and terrible. And the fact is that we can still gather here safely tonight and worship. But tonight, there are people in our world who cannot gather and worship like this. They're worshiping tonight in hiding. Because there are still parts of this world where Christians are persecuted. In our ministry, Gerald and I have had the chance to meet with people who work in those parts of the world. And we have heard stories that make your stomach turn. Stories of bravery of people who... Um, just fight amazing odds to get a few pages of scripture into someone's hand. Past 
pastors who are taught at night how to share the gospel because if they did it during the day, they'd be putting their lives at risk. That's the world that Saul is part of. That's the terror that he's inflicting. And that is the person that God chooses to share the gospel and build his church. That is amazing. It is amazing to me that God takes this person and chooses him for this amazing journey. I have no doubt that when Saul was um, getting close to Damascus, people would have heard about it. And I'm sure that there were people who started to get afraid and started to pray for protection. And this part is not in the Bible, and I'm not trying to add to it, but just knowing what I know about humanity, I have no doubt that people were saying, God, strike him down. Don't let him get near us. Strike him down. But God does the exact opposite. He doesn't strike Saul down. He raises him up. He uses him to share about grace. He uses Paul to teach us about salvation. If you were here when we did our Summer Advent Cafe series when we were out on the front lawn, um, there was one night when I preached a sermon on God's countercultural cup of love that he asks us to drink. How he asks us to love one another in a way that pushes beyond um, our human boundaries and biases and limits. And I see God doing it in this moment. I see him pouring out grace, unmerited favor upon Saul. I see him using him for such a glorious purpose. And I think it says so much about who God is. Because just as God knows the complexities and rules of creation better than we do, God knows the rules of love better than we do. Years after this, Paul is going to write a letter that we now know as the letter to the Romans, the book of Romans. And in that, he's going to write these words. He's going to say, For I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor the past, nor the present, nor any powers, nor any height, nor any depth, nor anything in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. Think about what it took to write that. Saul, who had persecuted Christians, recognized that nothing he had done or nothing he could do would stop God from loving him. So tonight, my friends, I need to ask you, thinking about Saul and all of what he was and all of what he'd done, if God could forgive him, don't you think he can forgive you? With all of who Saul was and all the ugliness that he brought into the world, if God can look at Saul and love him, don't you think he can love you? And Saul's life with all of the death and darkness and destruction that he brought into the world, if God can take that life and redeem it, and use it for his glory, and use it for his purpose. Don't you think he can do the same with you? Don't you think he can use your life for his glory and for his purpose? Of course he can. Because nothing can separate you from God's love. Thanks be to God. Amen.